First, I want you to listen to these words. This is a poem, and some of you have heard it before, maybe all of you. It's by Kipling, and it has one word, if. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too, if you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies or being hated, don't give way to hating. And yet, don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. If you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twist it by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings, and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss, and lose, and start again at your beginnings, and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to, ser to serve your turn long after they have gone, and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings, nor lose the common touch. If neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and which is more, you'll be a man, my son. So Kipling wrote this for his son, and there's a lot of wisdom in this little poem, and you need to look at it more closely because I'm not going to, I'm actually not uh, using this for the message today except as an introduction. There are many statements that start with the little word, if. I was tempted to go through a few different ones in the scriptures, but I decided or felt compelled to stick with only one. It's a small word, two little letters, but with huge implications. It's a conditional word. If, let's pray. Father, I invite your Holy Spirit into this place again, and obviously into my heart. And Lord, I pray that what's said here today will indeed be what you want said. And what's heard, what you want heard for each individual person. For this is your time, O oh God. And this is a time of reflection, of challenge, of worship, and hopefully of surrender. I thank you for hearing my prayer. And I thank you for being here and answering and I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You all know this text that I'm going to be working from today. And it starts with the word if. And it's not if 
you believe, all things are possible to him who believes. It's a different one. I was tempted to do that one. But uh, I'm coming, at, coming here today with Second Chronicles 7.14. And you can keep your book open, your Bible open to that verse if you wish. Second Chronicles 7.14. <clears throat> and once I start reading it, you will know it. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. How many of you haven't heard that text before? Anybody know the context in Second Chronicles 7.14? What was this all about? Where did this verse come in? It was actually during the days of King Solomon. It was in connection, believe it or not, to the dedication of the temple. It was around that same time period. And God was talking to Solomon and talking to the people and trying to get a message across. And he was saying, because God knew, and this was a time dealing with drought, real drought. Seems like you hear a lot about drought these days. There's drought in every part of the world, it seems. Parts of Canada, parts of Europe, parts of Australia. Everything is drying up, as are many people. There's lots of droughts in people's hearts. There's, a lot of, there's lots of dryness in the hearts of many of the professed people of God. Unfortunately, this little statement here, this conditional statement starting with the little word if, was in the context of when God's people would, would go astray because he knew they were going to go astray. And he says, sometimes you're going to start worshiping other gods because you want to be like the people around you. Does that sound familiar? We can't be too different because we might be considered oddballs. So we try to be as much like the prevailing culture as we can be and still belong to God. And of course, the children of Israel compromised and started slowly. And the next thing you know, they're full-blown idolaters and worshiping other gods. And the Lord said, when that happens, I'm going to send a drought through the land. Some people are uncomfortable with that too, but I'm not one of them. Because God does what God has to do to get people's attention. And he cared enough sometimes to send drought in the hopes that the people who were called by his name. I think sometimes Christians forget how important it is to take his name. Because if we profess to be his children, God and even unbelievers have the right to certain expectations. If we take his name, God expects us to live the life. And so can unbelievers. If I claim to be a Christian, unbelievers have the right to expect me to live like one. Amen? Of course they do. Even if I don't like it, they still have the right. A profession without a life is useless. If my people, I like that part, God is still calling them, even after all of their foolishness, and he's done the same to me, by the way. Uh, oh, these, the words in this verse have all applied to me in very recent times, because I've had to go through the whole thing. Even this summer, 
I've had to go through the whole thing. And it's been, it's been quite the experience that I've gone through this summer with this verse. Because just before I went to Alberta, one of the ladies at the Cape, Emily, Emily was leading out in prayer meeting, and she was using this verse. And it got very, uh, for me personally, it was a very challenging uh, series of meetings. It wasn't a long series, like maybe four or five meetings, but it was all dealing with this verse. And it was really tearing at me because I came to the staggering realization that I was in a drought, spiritually in a drought. And I don't know where you're at, but maybe some things have become clearer as I go through this. If my people who are called by my name, they're, in, they're, they're idolaters in the context of where this is said. I like the fact that God's still calling them, them my people. They're still called by his name. In my drought, God was still calling me my son. I need your attention. Because I have no pleasure in you wandering around in drought-infested land. Does God want us to be dry, spiritually dry? I don't think so. If my people who are called by my name, I think we should all do a study, and this is just a little prompt here. Look up some text later about being called by, or what it means to be in his name. It's amazing how many times that is used in Scripture to be using His name or to be called by His name. It involves far more than we probably realize. There's four, there's four parts. There are four things, four conditions that have to be met if we want to get out of drought. Maybe nobody here is in drought. Maybe I should sit down. Maybe everything, everybody here is flourishing. You're in the garden of God. Everything is well watered. Everything is growing. And you are flourishing for the Lord. I hope so. I, do, I know I wasn't doing that. If my people would do four things, the first one, and this is where the text comes in. If my people would humble themselves. I know we all love doing this. I know that nobody here likes to, uh, nobody here has any problem with not standing up for their rights in everything. Nobody here minds people saying things and not retaliating. You know, it's very interesting. We always want to defend our rights, defend ourselves. To humble ourselves. You know, it says that we have to humble ourselves. Because we will be humbled even if we don't do it ourselves. But the Lord is calling on us to humble ourselves. The text that we read in Isaiah 66 says that God sets up his residency or residence only with those who are humble. 
contrite in spirit, humble, trembling at his word. How many of you come before God and get into his word? Yes, the word is tremble. In the original language, is not something else. It means to tremble at his word. We simply means that we understand who we are in comparison to God. You can't approach the creator and the originator of the word in pride and self-satisfaction as if you already know what he said. We got to get it right. We don't like that word, to tremble before God, because we think it means we're afraid of Him. It doesn't mean that we're afraid of Him, because we're told to go before Him, how? Boldly, in Jesus' name. So it doesn't mean regular fear the way we understand fear. But the Bible is clear that we must have the fear of the Lord. And people can't seem to distinguish between the two. The fear of the Lord is a recognition of who I am in comparison to the greatness of God. I know my place. Unaided by God, do you realize that unaided by God, I can't understand anything in this book correctly? And neither can you. But many go to this book as if it's just an ordinary book. And that's why we hear so much foolishness supposedly coming from the Word of God. Here's another text. God opposes the proud, opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. That's in James chapter 4, verse 6. Micah says, walk humbly with your God. Psalms 25, 9 says, God guides, isn't this lovely? God guides the humble in what is right. I'm not going to know what's right if I'm full of pride. Check your heart. Go before God and ask Him if you have pride that you probably don't even know about. Because I'm pretty convinced that we all have it. And that includes myself. If we try to exalt ourselves, we will be humbled. If we humble ourselves before God, we will be Lifted up by whom? By him. Lifted up to be brother, better than our brothers and sisters? Of course not. Humble ourselves before God. If my people, who are called by my name, will first humble themselves, and secondly, pray. Now, a great deal of humbling comes through prayer. Those two actually go together. They don't need to be separated, really. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on prayer because we have to decide what prayer is to us. Some people have set times of prayer, like Daniel, and that's fine. But I hope we're not praying the same thing all the time. I hope we don't have set words, and that's the only words we ever use. The Bible says to pray without ceasing, and people go, you know, really? How can I pray without ceasing? It's easy to pray without ceasing, because we're always in an attitude of prayer. No matter where we are and what we're doing, prayers can be going up to God. Can they not? 
I can always be talking to God. If I'm driving, which is when I do a great deal of praying, and when I'm walking, and when I, whatever, if I'm in class, I've often prayed in class. Frankly, because I need to. But any time, anything that concerns my heart, anything that concerns your heart, the Lord wants us to talk about it with Him. We're so good at running around and talking to other people, in many cases who are just as disturbed as we might be, it's okay sometimes to share. But you know, we've got to tell the Lord. Humans cannot lift us to the place we need to get to. It can't be done. But the Lord's arm is not short. And He can save. Are we praying from our head? Or are we praying from our heart? I prayed a lot of prayers from my head. More than I care to admit. If my people will humble themselves and pray... And then it says, seek my face. Isn't that interesting? Seek my face. Are we able to go and look God in the eye? Can we look him in the face? Can, can, can we, we don't see him physically, but can we go before him? The whole thing is about what? There's a word that comes in here. If you're right beside someone and looking them in the eye and you're doing it with the right motives and stuff, it implies intimacy. God wants us to seek His face. You'd be surprised how many texts in the Bible talk about seeking God's face. Look them up. We just talked about the Bereans you have to go and look at the stuff I'm trying to say up here and see if it's actually in the Bible. Seek my face. I got three or four here. First Chronicles 16, 11, Look to the Lord and His strength. Seek His face always. Earnestly seek His face in Hebrews. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Let's be honest. How much are we holding back from God? That's a tough question. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. We do a lot of we do a lot of seeking in this world, seeking to do this and do that and get ahead. And all this, and we spend so little time sometimes seeking God when He's already said, if we seek Him first, He'll get us through the rest of it. Here's a good one here Psalm 63, verse 1. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you, I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. Can you say that today? Can I say that today? I can say that much more now than I could three months ago. It's amazing what the Spirit of God will do in us when we turn toward Him. And look how the verse ends. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. Right? Fits right in with the drought motif. We haven't been stuck out in the desert, I'm guessing, without water. I've been in deserts, but I had water. I haven't been walking through the sands and dying of thirst. There'd be nothing else in this world that you would long for as much as you would long for water. So my question this morning is this. Do we long for God 
like that? It's a big question. Do we long for his presence? One thing is certain. If, there's the word again, if we don't seek, we will never find. Amen? And the other part to that is this. We must seek till we do find. If we don't seek, we are not going to find. And we must seek until we do find. And guess what? Sometimes it's going to require a great deal of seeking. Because there's many things that God wants to show us when he shows us his face. That's a sermon all in its own. What's in the face of God. And here's the big one. This is the one that trips up the vast majority of Christians. This is the one, the next one, that actually leads to the drought. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn around. It's the same as repentance. Would turn from their wicked, yes, the word is wicked, and it doesn't only apply to idolatry. It applies to anything that takes us outside of God's will. Another word is disobedience or unrighteousness. They all mean the same thing. I'm not one of those people who's afraid to use the word obedience in the pulpit. Because you don't hear the word very much anymore as if it's some sort of uh, uh, anathema or something to say that God's people should be obedient. When the Bible says it over and over and over and over. Because people in touch with God are obedient people. The problem with the Israelites is they kept disobeying. So here's the word. Are we, are we living a disobedient life in anything at all? Because if we are, and I know by experience, if we are disobeying God and we know that what he's telling us, we know it clearly, and we refuse to deal with it, we cannot grow the way God wants us to grow. It has to be dealt with. It has to be dealt with. Disobedience leads to, eventually, death. And what's so wonderful about sin, anyway? What has sin ever done for me that's positive? I could tell you a lot of negative things that sin has done for me, but I can't tell you one positive thing that sin has done for me. When I'm in rebellion against God's will, my life is in misery whether I admit it or not. God is asking me to turn from my sinful ways. 1 John 3, 7 says that the person who practices righteousness is righteous. Not the person who says they're righteous. A lot of righteousness by faith these days is actually sinning by presumption. That's another sermon. It's righteousness by faith. It's not sinning by faith. And sadly, it's what, that's what it's become for many Christians. God knows I'm only human. If I'm only human, God have mercy on me, saying to you, because God has made me a partaker of the divine nature in Jesus Christ. I have, I have no desire, and it's hard for me to say this because I know what sin can do. I know what it is to be a slave of sin. Whoever is your master, that's the one you obey. 
If sin is my master, I obey sin. I don't want to be in slavery. I want to be free. Do you want to be free? The Lord can do anything. And the Lord can certainly save me from not only the penalty of sin, but also the power of sin. If he can't, the gospel is useless. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn, just turn around, turn away from it, then, the then doesn't come in till the conditions are met. You notice that? Then, God says, then will I hear from heaven and forgive the sins and what? Heal in context first. Heal the land because the land is under drought. But we can take that by extension. And heal the what? The soul. God can heal the dryness. God is a master healer. God can heal us emotionally, physically, spiritually, mentally, whatever word you want to use, the redemption of Christ covers everything. He is the great healer. You'll be surprised how many times Scripture puts salvation and healing together. It's amazing. There's quite a few if you go through the Word of God. God is in the business of restoration. And he can restore the years that the locusts have eaten, if you know that text. I like that text. Of course, the locusts eat everything. You don't have things growing, so you're in a kind of a drought situation, sort of. And the locusts can take out the spiritual life. Spiritual locusts. Then will I hear from heaven. How much do you think God yearns to have us meet those conditions so that he can do what he wants to do? It's all part of the covenant. Sometimes we talk about God's covenant. He says he wants to write his will on our hearts and we will do his will because he gives us the power to do it. But you know, in any covenant... There's two parties. God is always faithful. Is God always faithful to his side of the covenant? God is always faithful. If there's any unfaithfulness in the covenant, it comes from our side. For the covenant to work, we have to honor our pledge in the covenant. The conditions have to be met. So, the little word if, what are we going to do with it? The Lord challenged me, the Lord challenged me very seriously with this verse not very long ago. And because I was in a drought. I decided, yes, decided, because we always have choice. The Lord will not force me to humble myself. He will not force me to pray. He will not force me to seek his face. And he will not force me to turn from my sinful ways and my sinful attitudes. Because of course, we know why. So I had a choice to make. And I'm learning that much in a short time. I barely know what to do with it. And it's only just begun. And I want God to heal me and heal me completely. And if you're suffering from any kind of drought or God shows you anything, my prayer for you is that you will cooperate with God. 
because he wants us to surrender all that we are, everything. He wants us totally. And if it's not total, I can assure you that we will not have a happy, productive Christian life. We can give ourselves to God. He knows we have to grow, and we will grow on from here. It's wonderful how much the Lord has in store for us. Absolute surrender.